So one day Jesus was praying and his closest disciples, his inner circle, they were watching and listening to him And as they had done many times before, but on this particular occasion, one of them mustered enough courage to approach Jesus when he was finished, and he asked this question uh, on behalf of the whole group. He said, well, Jesus, could you teach us how to pray? And one reason why he asked was because they were listening and they were watching Jesus pray And they had somewhere along the way had come to the conclusion, it was kind of funny, that they had been doing it wrong. And so we thought it would be a great idea to uh, have a series called Teach Me to Pray. Because when's the last time you ask that question of anybody? In fact, uh, if somebody would come up to you after you prayed out loud and would say to you, I think you're doing that wrong. That would be a little offensive, right? That would be a little offensive. So, so Jesus, over the next several weeks, he's going to teach us how to pray. And my hope and my prayer for you is God's going to speak to you through this series. But it might be a little um, uh, offensive from time to time. But I hope uh, from uh, your perspective, you're, you're going you're gonna to learn a lot. And you might, abs- you might say the same thing. Uh-oh, I've been doing it wrong. But that's okay. And if we're really honest, it's okay because uh, when it comes to uh, our prayer life, isn't it true that very few of our prayers actually happened to come true? I mean, if we're really honest, I mean, unless you count the ones that are probably going to happen anyway, right? I mean, after all, it turns out that your wallet really was where you last left it. And after all, you did get the parking spot that you've been praying for and circling the parking lot, but so did a hundred other non-prayers get a parking spot, right? And your team, it turns out, did win, but they were expected to win. And, you know, when they're not expected to win, they, they don't win. And so we're not talking about those kinds of prayers. We're talking about the kinds of prayers that you might consider to be uh, um, praying for a miracle, That is, if God doesn't come through, then it won't come true. And occasionally you get a yes, but let's be honest, most often you get nothing. And maybe for you it was a series of nothings that convinced you that prayer is nothing. That it's just a waste of time because prayer doesn't work. Now what we're going to discover is you're right. Those kinds of prayers most often don't work, at least not the way we want them to do. But Jesus prayed, and he taught his disciples to pray, and we almost instinctively pray anyway, so we thought we need to walk through this for a few weeks. Now remember, Jesus' followers, they were taught from an early age how to pray some strong scripted prayers from their church leaders or religious leaders from their mom and dad but over time they were watching Jesus and they grew envious of the type of prayer that he was praying it was as if there was something special between him and God it was compelling it was moving it was conversational there was something going on with the way that Jesus so they asked the question teach us how to pray now if you don't consider so what's interesting is the way that Jesus begins here is he doesn't teach anybody how to pray he tells them what not to do and if you're not really a church person and you're here today kind of feeling like you're looking on the outside and you're not a church person you're going to really like this because Jesus addresses some of the hypocrisy of the church people the religious people of the day and so let's go back and let's listen to what he said okay you want to pray let me tell you what not to do and when you pray here comes the first don't do don't be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Now, this is the part that you got to love about Jesus because Jesus had no tolerance for pretenders. He had no tolerance for pretension. He had no tolerance for people who thought that they were better than other people. And the reason why he didn't is because he knew the hearts of those people. He knew what was in those people. In fact, they were worse because they were hiding behind their elevated positions they were hiding the fact that they were they were just like everybody else they were hiding behind their hypocrisy or they were hiding 
behind their pretension. And so he says, truly I tell you, those hypocrites, they've received their reward in full. In other words, uh, God won't reward them because God is not moved or impressed with perfectly scripted uh, public prayers by inauthentic people. And they wanted attention, and they got it from the public. But they weren't going to get it from God, he continued. But when you pray, but when you pray, pause. Now, this raises some of the first questions. When do you pray? Do you pray? Why do you pray? And then another question we're going to hear is where do you pray? These are the questions that Jesus was interested in. Now, remember, Jesus' followers had the same problems that we have, that prayers that seemingly were not answered. And the religious leaders of the day, to make matters worse, they had their take on why that was happening. Their take was, look, God answers and hears prayers, but they, God just doesn't hear your prayers because you're not holy enough. You're not obedient enough. And for some of you, somebody might have told you the same thing or some version of the same thing, that God doesn't hear your you know, prayer because you have to have more faith or you have to sin less. And then you look around, and it seems like other people's prayers are getting answered. And so it makes you wonder whether that's true. Well, let's go back to Jesus. He goes on, when you pray, go into your room, close the door. Wait, close the door? We have to go, we have to isolate ourselves? We have to find a room? We have to find a place and isolate ourselves? And later he's going to tell us why we need to do so, um, which kind of begs the question, again, another question, where do you pray? He says, Go into the room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. So Jesus instructs us to pray to God, our unseen Father, uh, to pray to God, not him, and more importantly, to address our unseen uh, God in relational terms. And maybe it was this relational approach that piqued the interest of the disciples. Because when Jesus prayed, he just prayed in a way that seemed so natural, so conversational. And his followers began to, to catch that, um, how that was so different than what they were doing. In other words, Jesus says, I want you to find a place so you can use whatever words you need to use. So you can use whatever tone that you need to use. So I want you to pray in private so that you can pour your heart out to God. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now there's that word again, reward. We heard it earlier when it was the religious leaders who received a reward when they prayed in public. Uh, they already got their reward. It was the attention from the, uh, from the public. And, and what Jesus is saying is there's a reward uh, when you pray in private because you're seen by your Father in heaven. What if that's true? What if God sees you when you pray in private and hears your prayers when you're sharing it privately? Whew. What would you pray if you absolutely knew he was there watching, listening? Jesus goes on and gives us another not to. And he says, and when you pray, don't keep babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Now, this Greek word for babbling kind of sounds like babbling. It's batalegeko, uh, batalegeko. Don't keep battlegechoing uh, and using words and, and using your big words and, and repeating all of your big words. He says, don't, don't say the same thing over and over again because repetition doesn't necessarily move God and length and style doesn't impress God. He's not looking for the right words. He's not looking for the right religious words or so many words or a carefully formulated words. He says, don't be like them. And what Jesus says next is actually explains why we don't need a lot of words and we don't even have to use the, the right words or the correct words. In fact, what Jesus says next 
pulls the rug out underneath as to why we oftentimes pray. And I think he did this on purpose. So he says, the reason why you don't need to go on and on and on is because your father knows what you need before you ask him. Wait, what? Yeah, he already knows what you need before you ask him. Now that begs the question, if God already knows what I need, then uh, why then, Jesus, do I need to pray at all? Why do I have to ask? And this is where Jesus wanted to take the disciples into this tension, into this question. And this is where he wants to take you and me to the point where we have to wonder, wait, 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 wait. Uh, why, then why are we praying? And now usually Jesus, he, he'll pose a question or create some tension, then he'll walk away. And you're like, but, 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 but. But Jesus, fortunately, he resolves this and answers them. Well, he says then, this is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. Interesting. Not dear Jesus. Our Father in heaven. Your perfect heavenly Father. Now this raises an important question. Does this mean that God is male? Does this mean that God is masculine? What about uh, God... Uh, our heavenly mother or what about our heavenly deity or what about our heavenly being in fact Jesus himself said in other places that God is spirit and John the Baptist or uh, John wrote that God is love so I want to encourage you to not get caught up in the terminology because if you get caught up in the terminology you very well might miss you might miss out on something very important that Jesus is trying to say because Jesus is inviting us into something far more intimate than spirit, far more intimate than being, far more um, natural and relational than heavenly even ruler or judge. He's inviting us to, into something relational and non-formulaic. In fact, Peter wrote, cast your cares upon him because he cares about you. It was intimate, it was personal, it was relational. Jesus says, look, the best way for us mere mortals, to, for you to mere mortals to approach the incomprehensible God is to approach him as a perfect father. Now listen, for me, that language, and for a lot of people, that language is okay. That that's fine. I mean, I had a good father growing up, and I'm a father. But for other people, that terminology and that word picture is a little more challenging. And here's some good news on that, that your Heavenly Father knows that. And your Heavenly Father wants, your perfect Heavenly Father wants you to know that He's sensitive to, to that. And He appreciates it. And He wants to care for you with that. And so my advice is just to bring that with you into prayer. Because if Jesus is correct, to opt for any other terminology or image or concept of heaven than Heavenly Father might mean that you're going to miss the very core of what he's trying to teach us. Our Father in heaven. And then he goes on. And here, here's something we skip. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. You see, when we pray, we should pause long enough to actually acknowledge who we're addressing, the God of the universe, the God who created the world, the God who is the God of all things and still in control. This is the God that we've been invited to say, Heavenly Father, in such an intimate way. What a privilege it is that we need to pause long enough to be able to acknowledge and pray with a sense of awe. And you see, you can't do that in traffic, can you? So he says, you need to get alone. Get some space. Close the door. And if you skip this part, it's going to be so easy to think of God simply as a vending machine. I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. And It'll also, if, if you don't pause long enough to all the beauty and the majesty of the sovereign God of the universe who actually wants to be a part of your life, then it's going to be easier to skip this next part. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Wait. Your kingdom. Your will. What about my kingdom? What about my will? What about my job? What about my family? What about my lack of job? What about my fears? What about my bills? What about my daughter who doesn't talk to me anymore? What, 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 what about me? And Jesus says, I already covered that. Your heavenly father already knows before you even ask. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that already. So that, that means I don't have to start with that? No, you don't. Your heavenly father already knows. You see, when we pause long enough to, to really comprehend who it is that we're trying, who we're trying to address, then there's nothing else to say. But the, your kingdom first. My kingdom can wait. Your will. My will isn't nearly as important. Then your will be done. This is what Jesus was talking about when he was talking about seeking first the kingdom of God. See, the point and purpose of prayer is to align and realign ourselves with the purpose that God has given you. The point and purpose of prayer is to align and realign ourselves with the purpose that God has given to you, with the kingdom will, with your purpose. Heavenly Father, before I even ask anything, I'm going to acknowledge, I'm going to, I want to do your will. I don't even know what it is yet. It doesn't matter because I love you so much. I am in such awe that I get to address you. I, I'll do your will, Lord. And you know all about the things that I would pray for even before I pray for them. So I, whatever, they're taken care of. I just want to do your will. That's the point of prayer is to be able to get to that point. To be able to say, thy will be done. In fact, this is what, what Jesus was wrestling in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he went to the cross. He, he so struggled, which is really remarkable. He said, God, I, I, don't, I, I don't know. And ultimately he said, but thy will be done. And do you know what hung in the balance when he said that? When his willingness to go to the cross, his willingness to put his heavenly father's will before his own will, what hung in the balance was you, was, was me, was all of us. What hung in the balance was the fact that now we have this foretaste of the kingdom to come, that we can participate in God's heavenly relationship with us. That's what hung in the balance. That means you don't have to wonder whether God is for you or not. You don't have to wonder whether God's going to show up in your stresses and things you're worrying about about tomorrow. You don't have to worry about that anymore because what hung in the balance when Jesus finally said, but thy will be done and headed off and sacrificed himself was you and me, our salvation and our life with Christ. That's what hung in the balance. And so Jesus is inviting us to pray, and he's inviting us to live as he lived, submitted to the will of our Heavenly Father. And really, to kind of be blunt about this, if we pray with any other posture than our submission to our Heavenly Father, Jesus would say, then you're not doing it the right way. And isn't it true it's so easy to skip that part? Thy will be done. Prayer is about beginning your day surrendered. It's why we do it. So the question is, what's keeping you from praying? That's the first question. And what's keeping you from praying, thy will be done? Not mine, but yours. And I, I'll just give you an assumption because it's true for me. Fear. I'm a little, I don't know where God's ultimately going to take me. And I'm a little fear of uncertainty. How about the fear of having to give stuff up, of missing out on something? There's a fear there, God. What if I don't live the life? What is it that keeps you from praying, thy will be done? And here's, here's my final hint. Whatever's keeping you from praying and surrendering your will to God's will and praying that prayer, chances are that's the thing, that's where God wants to show up in your life. So my prayer for you for this week is to pray the way Jesus instructed and 
get up every morning, find a place, say, dear Heavenly Father, I have a big long list, but before I even get to that, I'm giving you the glory. Thanks for giving me the privilege to talk with you this morning. I trust you, and I trust you're going to take care of me. Now I'm going to just simply do what you want me, want, want me to do today. And then you wake up the next day, and you do it again. And as you do it, take note. God will show up somewhere along the way, and it'll blow your faith up. Let's pray. Gracious God, this is a message that's not brand new. I mean, we hear this all the time, really. Thy will be done. But we usually like to segment that into a part of our life, not all of our lives. So to think of you, Lord, as the CEO of our life, Help us to do your will. Help us to establish a new rhythm where we're leaning on you every day, every morning. And show us, show us the love and the care that the promise that you've given us in Jesus is absolutely true. We pray this in your name.